Good morning to all of you. A warm welcome to our CPD webinar organized by GMOA and Society for Health Research and Innovation. Today we are experiencing a small technical error. Please bear with us. I hope you all can hear myself. So continuing with that, we are glad to inform that each participant of this CPD webinar will be receiving an e-certificate for their participation. And please stay with us until the end of this session and we will be releasing the link in the chat box. Uh, let's move to today's topic. It's abnormal vaginal bleeding. To avoid interactions during this lecture, kindly mute your microphones and turn off the camera and use the chat box to clear your doubts at the end of the session. Uh, please use the standard abbreviation to ask your questions. So now, uh, it's my utmost pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Sharada Kannangara, consultant gynecologist specialized in gynecological oncology currently attached to the Apeksha Hospital, Maharagama. He is also an executive committee member of Government Medical Officers Association. Thank you for joining us sir, today um, and over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, to, good morning to everybody. And yeah, so I'll, uh, so the topic was given to me today, the abnormal vaginal bleeding. So, I think it is pretty much important topic and which you may have heard this lecture over and over again in your medical school and in your practices. And the, if anybody is into the postgraduate stream of the gyne gyne obstetric and gynecology, so the abdomen vaginal bleeding is uh, the one of the topics which we need to discuss. So at the time, while I'm delivering the lecture, if you have any questions, then and there, just uh, drop it in the chat box. So at the end of the session, I will go through all the questions and I will try to answer the all the questions. And at the at the discussion session, you can ask verbal questions as well. So I'll start with the abdominal vaginal bleeding. So the vaginal bleeding. So as a gynecologist and What is this? Is it true? Something popping. Is that true? No, no. Right. Okay. So, so as a gynecologist, you will be encountering this kind of patients, and this is a very vast area, and. Even as a doc, uh, even as a doctor, when you're treating a GP and in the specialty, this is one of the common knowledge uh, every should doctor should go have. So I'm not going into any specialized details to this lecture. What I will be doing is to introduce and more make it make it more simplified and let you know when it is come so how do you categorize and what needed to be at immediately what is needed not what is not bothered too much and you can leave it alone and reassuring the reassuring a patient is more important and and proper referral at the same time is also important yeah okay so and before going to the abnormal bleeding describe the abnormal bleeding so the vaginal bleeding we you we all know it comes from the uterus or any part of the genital tract also can be uh, involved so but most of the time more than 90 percent of the time is the uterine bleeding so it's there are some people dis dis describe it as abnormal uterine bleeding as well that is but i selected the more broader topic of abnormal vaginal bleeding which cover the bleeding from the lower genital tract as well. So before go into the describe the abnormal bleeding, we should know what is the know how the normal menstrual cycle is. Usually the normal menstrual cycle is about 21 to 35 days. And uh, so we all know heard that uh, we all no, that is a, it's 28 days is the usual mean, but we very hardly get 
uh, women who get exactly 28 day menstrual cycles. But if she's if if somebody is getting a exact 28 days menstrual cycle, which mean uh, once in a one lunar month, and that is actually she is very lucky in the sense if somebody is getting a regular 28 day menstrual cycles mean it is very unlikely she got any gynecological issues. So that is the uh, putting it in the opposite way. So we talk about all the menstrual irregularities, but some people are bothered about any issues in her womb, the genital tract. So the first question you should ask is what is the menstrual cycle looks like? So if somebody is having regular 28 days menstrual cycles with a normal flow, it is very unlikely she has a gyne she has a gynecological issue. So that is one of the take home messages which I would like to reiterate because the first question you can ask if somebody is bothered about the abnormalities or any pathology in the lower genital tract or the in the gynecological assessment, the menstrual cycle. So, but if she doesn't have a regular menstrual cycle, then what we should be looking at? So the normal menstrual cycle is usually is about some people may have 21 day, day cycle, but it is one something is less than uh, 21 days is not normal, which we call is abnormal. And and more one if the menstrual cycle is more than 35 days, also we call it oligomenorrhea. And uh, it is usually last for about three days, three to four days is a normal, but still you can have the two to seven days of menstrual cycle. And usual blood loss is about 80 milliliters per day, but it is as you may, as anybody is know, no one is measuring the menstrual blood. So it is very difficult to have an objective assessment about exact volume of the menstrual blood. So how we categorize the heavy menstrual bleeding is usually how the woman feels about it. So if it is very heavy or if it is how many how many sanitary pads she uses per day, if it is more than four to five, then it, we can think it may be heavy menstrual bleeding or even in sometimes and uh, sometimes some people need to use the double protection. So this kind of a thing you can have a some sort of assessment. And the other thing is about having clots. So that there's in normal menstrual flow, there is no clots. So if somebody is complaining about having clots, so which mean she, she is likely to have a heavy menstrual flow. So that is the, so before we talk about the normal menstrual, the abnormal vaginal bleeding, that is the four key four steps you need to be keep in mind when describe a menstrual cycle. Then any deviation, of course, we can have a discussion or have assessment about how this menstrual, how the how, what is the abnormality of the bleeding? <coughs> so you will come across so much of a terms: menorrhagia, metorrhagia, menometrhagia, oligomenorrhea, polymenorrhea, heavy menstrual bleeding, and of course I haven't mentioned it here: dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia. So I think you all are familiar with these kind of a terms. But terms are good at when you are going for exam or writing a paper or writing a research article or anything that is where you need to have a terms but actual situation i'm talking about a practical situation when you deal with a patient it is not really necessary to remember all the terms so the terms and uh, is describe certain patterns and certain Sometimes they are not very clear cut, very arbitrary. So I will briefly go through menorrhagia is technically described as more than 80 milliliters of blood, but it is 
called heavy menstrual bleeding and that is what i have mentioned in the bottom is hmb heavy menstrual bleeding so the heavy menstrual bleeding or abnormal vaginal bleeding is one of the common terms even nowadays we use rather than exact terms because it is easy to describe so if it is metrorrhagia which means you can have the irregular bleeding which is not very consistent with the cycle either uh, so some sometimes you will have a 19 day and then about 35 days and 20 days that kind of a thing then if it is we call it metrorrhagia and oligomenorrhea obviously is if it is cycle is more than 35 days which we call it oligomenorrhea and polymenorrhea is a shorter cycle than 21 days that is inconsistent with that which i described earlier that the normal cycle so if it is less than 21 days polymenorrhea more than 35 days oligomenorrhea these kind of terms you can term use in technically but in a situation when you actually look at the patients the knowing the exact meaning of the terms is not very important but what is important is you have to understand what is wrong with the patient so that then i'll take it in a clinical point of view suppose a girl and a patient comes to you and complain about the bleeding problem and so what the first question you should ask so any idea what is the first question you need to know about the patient actually the first question is you have to know the patient's age so depend on the age there are a lot of differences of management a lot of differences of differential diagnosis a lot of differences of risk and these are the things you have to know the age of the patients is pretty much important so i'll go through uh, when I go through the presentation, I'll describe it. So usually, then one of the common question at the age, which age usually the menarche? Menarche is about 12 to 13 years, but it's becoming more and more advanced. And so, but it can be delayed up to 16, age of 16 years. So most of the common problem that the mothers will come the when the uh, with with their daughters when they did not attend menarche maybe at the age of 13 14 but obviously you can wait up to 16 years but what you have to be in mind you have to have even if it is at the age of 13 14 you have to have an assessment about secondary sexual characteristics. So if there are secondary sexual characteristics present, you know, the telarche, pubarche, and those things, if there are, if the breast development is there, the pubic hair development is there, so obviously you can wait, which means the hormones are active. But suppose a 16-year-old, a 15-year-old girl comes and it, she looks like a 9-year-old girl, then of course you, you are not waiting for for 16 years or anything anything longer you need to start investigation even at the age of 14 if there's no secondary sexual characteristics you need to be properly referred to adolescent gynecology and then start investigating about the hormones hypothalamus all sort of a thing so that's why we need to have an assessment whether that girl is actually having the menarche is having a menstrual bleeding is not the so menarche is a as you know the menarche is a process so even you don't have the you have the uh, menstrual bleeding and that is if there are puberty is, is in place so you can wait for up to 16 weeks but there's if there's no secondary sexual characteristics you need to start investigating and the other common problem is when you have a menarche at the age of 12 or 13 she may not have another period for another two years so that is quite normal and most of the mothers start worrying about it but that is normal and you they can still have the uh, post or because of that their their hypothalamus pituitary ovary and axis are not yet matured so they still can have a post about for two years that is quite normal and but nowadays what you have to be aware of is pcos pcos common now we can see 
in very young girls. So obviously, when you when you can diagnose a girl when she's walking in with the PCOS because of if the patient suppose a mother comes with a girl about 13 years of age, she attend a menarche around 11 years, and mother complain about she doesn't have period for two years now maybe or one year and so according to the definition you can say you can wait for a two years but if the girl is having when you observe if the girl is having a facial hair and if she's very of very high bmi and obviously you have to treat her what is the treatment is you have to advise about the weight reduction avoid of the food obviously some girls some teenagers are more tend to have a lot of chunky foods like uh, you know all these McDonald's and where are the unhealthy food habits so you have to get rid of these unhealthy food habits so then of course prevent the PCOS because of the PCOS is the at the moment is the commonest problem of having a menstrual problems in young girls so it is even up to age of 30 35 the pcos you have to be have in your mind in differential diagnosis inquire into their food habits how many what is the level of uh, the starch they take what is the level of exercise they have what is the level of fiber diets they have so these are the things you need to be asked about the food habits and give as little advices on food habits and then that might change because you know when it comes to the this teenage the girls at the age of 15 and 16 they are a bit uh what you call they are maybe not trying to liberate them from their parents and they change their foods habit and they're not listening to their parents so and, and the parents may be difficult to impose their the dietary advisors on them so that is where when it is but when it come to a doctor so the doctor can tell it it sometimes it works so therefore take an initiative to inquire about a food habit when a uh, when a girl comes with the abnormal uh, vaginal bleeding so which can be a precipitating cause so and the oligomenorrhea so as i mentioned what is oligomenorrhea is delayed period so i mentioned it the periods can be delayed at, at menarche however we need to investigate about the pcos and when it comes to oligomenorrhea at the any age from menarche even up to 35 36 even up to 40 45 years so if there is early gomenorrhea, you have to inquire about PCOS. So what is PCOS? Polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's a spectrum of the metabolic syndrome. So the uh, the metabolic syndrome, which carries the diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesteremia, subfertility, these all are the part of the metabolic syndrome, which we have given different names and different specialties. But the uh, PCOS, you have to understand, it is caused by the lifestyles. It is not, not there, there is a slight genetic predisposition from the maternal side, the obesity and the uh, hypertension. However, it is mainly caused by the food habits and the lifestyle. The diet and exercise is the main stone the cornerstone of management of pcos so when you when you come to when you uh, when a girl come with oligomenorrhea don't just prescribe no ethistrone or anything to make the menstruation but give a little bit of dietary advices and try to change her dietary advice and make it make sure that the pcos at, at take a small step to reverse the pcos because pcos is a killer now when we talk about the endometrial cancers earlier the endometrial cancers you may learn in your medical school the endometrial cancer is a disease of old age so it caused the postmenopausal bleeding and 
perimenopausal bleeding, you have to investigate for endometrial cancers. It is never happening young girls like age of 30s or even 20s. But now the scenario has changed. I have been working as a gynecological cancer surgeon for about five years. And every month there's a girl with under age of 30 with endometrial cancer that is all attributed to the suffer, uh, the PCOS. With very high endometrial thickening. And when you see some, most of the time they come for treatment of subfertility. But when they come for the treatment of subfertility, when you assess the endometrium, you can find either hyperplasia or cancer where she need at the she will lo lose her uterus at very young age. So PCOS don't take it easy at telling as if it is a food habit or a chubby girl, but that is a killer. So you need to take a serious concern. As a doctors, we need to make initiative about reversing these food habits. This is the most likely reason for the endometrial cancers. And of course, if these are excluded, then of course you have to think about other rare disorders like Meyer-Rokitansky or genetic disorders and the congenital abnormalities. Those are very highly specialized areas. And the dysmenorrhea. Dysmenorrhea, of course, it's not a bleeding problem, but that is the pain during menstruation. So, what it is in the mind, what is what causes? It's usually the endometriosis. We all know again, it causes with the endometriosis, adenomyosis, and PID. And the endometriosis and adenomyosis, we all know the endometriosis is the presence of endometrial tissue outside the endometrial cavity, which bleed at which with every menses. And that bleeding doesn't come out with the menstrual flow. It accumulate in the places like pouch of Douglas, ovary, tubes, and even in the uterine wall, which call adenomyosis. So these things then will cause the uh, pain during menstruation. So most of the time, this pain is associated with subfertility and dyspareunia. So, so these things need to be treated and properly assessed. So if it is, doesn't respond to the simple painkillers like panadine or paracetamol, then of course you need to have a transvaginal scans and then assessment of the endometriosis with the proper gynecology referral. And the menorrhagia, which we call heavy menstrual bleeding, the commonest cause of menorrhagia is fibroids. And, and adenomyosis is a, usually occur in women more than age of 40 years. And you can have endometrial polyp. And what is dysfunctional uterine bleeding? Dysfunctional uterine bleeding is the, in the absence of any other structural anatomical abnormalities, that is, which is caused by hormones. So only at the dysfunctional uterine bleeding, you can treat with hormone to tablet like con combined oral, oral contraceptive pills or progesterone like uh, noethisterone. So now you can understand if it is dysmenorrhea and menorrhagia, most likely diagnosis is adenomyosis. So that's how the gynecological working diagnosis diagnosis works. So you take the symptoms and if it is a couple of combination of symptoms, you can have a working diagnosis, even with the history. And the intermenstrual bleeding. So the intermenstrual bleeding is means so that's why there's some people call menorrhagia, but we I use prefer the term intermenstrual bleeding. This is in be bleeding in between the menstrual cycles. So, and you have to be, it can be a cervical ectropion or dysfunctional uterine bleeding, as I mentioned. But what is more important is that you have to consider a cervical cancer if there is a postcoital bleeding as well. So, if there is intermenstrual bleeding, you need to, you can't do a speculum examination for each and every patient, but if they are complaining about intermenstrual bleeding and postcoital bleeding, it is mandated to have a speculum examination. So the and the cervical polyps also can cause intermenstrual bleeding. So that is why. So then we can our the examination techniques, the examination necessities change with the, these symptoms.
and the postmenopausal bleeding. Postmenopausal bleeding, we all know it's most of the time, 80% of the time, it's caused by the vaginal atrophy. That is the atrophic changes of the vagina after menopause. There's no hormonal effect. But we have to exclude the endometrial hyperplasia and cancer, which is about 20% of the case. And cervical cancer also can cause us the postmenopausal bleeding. So it is pretty much important to ask about the smear history of each and every patient. Which with the uh, It is important to have the uh, ask about the smear history with a patient of intermenstrual uh, with the abnormal uterine bleeding. So the irregular vaginal bleeding again, it's not like kind of intermenstrual bleeding. So we need to have act as the exclude the endometrial cancer in the perimenopausal age, but most of the time. Hormonal issues in younger age and PCOS again come into the playing in the picture. All right, so I, this is other these key symptoms I wanted to give. I don't want to go in the details about or about the diagnosis and the management of the diagnosis, but what I wanted to know, what I wanted you to know about so how to categorize these bleeding patterns and how it comes with a, with a different working diagnosis. So in nutshell. If it is a younger age, most likely it is about to have a hormonal issue, DUB, but you have to have a PCOS. PCOS again comes with a hormonal issue. And if there's oligomenorrhea, if a young girl is having oligomenorrhea, don't ever take it lightly. Especially if it is more than three months, she need to have a scan and endometrial assessment because she may be developing endometrial cancer. So the oligomenorrhea is caused when it is, so usually we have to have a regular menstrual cycle. So if there's no regular menstrual cycle, if it is no shedding of the endometrium, the, the endometrium will continue to proliferate and proliferation will end up in the cancer. So therefore, it is very much important to inquire about how the frequency of bleeding so if a girl hasn't has a period for more than three months, that endometrium need to be evaluated. The same, same etiology, same pathophysiology at perimenopause, we have anovulatory cycles the, at the end. So when there's no anovulatory cycles, there's no corpus luteum, again, anopause estrogen. So then anopause estrogen is a culprit for the endometrial cancers. So therefore we need to have a proper assessment about the uh, when there's a when there's one doesn't have the menstru uh, menstruation and the older age obviously you need to have again more have more idea about the uh, the middle age you need to have the intermenstrual bleeding irregular bleeding you need to have a cervical pathologies most of the time ectropians polyps are the benign condition and obviously cin and cervical cancers can be occur. And the, again, the perimenopausal or after a menopause, most likely reason is the endometrial cancers. So therefore, these are the important things you need to keep in mind when you are assessing a lady with abnormal vaginal bleeding. Thank you very much, sir, for the excellent presentation. Once again, uh, this is the common question we ask to all the consultants, what are the common mistakes uh, we uh, usually do as a primary uh, care doctors? Okay, so the common mistakes, is as I mentioned, so one is one of the one of the commonest mistake which I all I all want all to have a take home message is not considering oligomenorrhea or absence of menstruation seriously because the absence of the menstruation earlier when there is no uh, when there is no menstruation earlier the girls used to be think. It is a blessing actually because some people, some girls, having a menstruation is a is an issue. So they can't go to the school, they can't go to the work, and there's abdominal pain. And so not some people like not having menstruation. And even that has been reinforced by sometimes the primary care doctors because 
so when they come sometimes the people comes for a treatment for not having menstruation they say it's okay there's what what is it so if you are not not planning for a child so there's no need to have a menstruation so but that is actually a misconception and the menstruation need to be have regular menstruation is a sign of good health sign of good gynecological health that's what i mentioned having a regular menstruation is a sign of good gynecological health and if somebody is not having having particularly having oligomenorrhea she need to be investigated because that oligomenorrhea means there is unopposed estrogen activity inside the endometrial cavity so if you you know if it in singular language so in very uh the in singular language in in singular we call it mass shuddhiya so mass shuddhiya is come you call it clearing shuddha beam so this is actually the singular word has a better meaning than menstruation menstruation doesn't have any meaning so the singular word actually have a very good meaning of what is menstruation is mashuddhya it is monthly clearing so it it is monthly clearing you need to as a woman you need to have a monthly clearing so there we are all this uh the endometrium shed off clear it off and that clearing off is prevent you have it, prevent a woman having a cancer so that is as a cancer surgeon as actually that is one of my main concern and the other thing is about when to have a speculum examination so most people you know the speculum examination is a bit cumbersome and more not not very easy to do in each and every patient with a vaginal bleeding so the but it is mandatory to have a speculum examination if somebody is having intermenstrual bleeding and postcoital bleeding so because of the assessment of the cervical pathology so when there is a suspicious of a cervical pathology one need to have a speculum examination thank you very much sir uh, we are getting more questions from the participants uh, okay. uh, the question is sir uh, um, when a lady presenting with the uh, um, heavy menstrual bleeding with hormonal contraceptive pills uh, yeah. what what do you advise on that when a lady has bleeding with hormonal contraceptive and cannot have a uced yeah. so actually it is uh, the hormonal contraceptives is even used as a treatment for heavy menstrual bleeding because of once it is very unlikely with the one who is on hormonal contraceptive is having heavy menstrual bleeding because it's hormonal contraceptive means you are giving outside hormones because a young young girls they having a hormonal contraceptive is most of the time uh is give, taking the control of outer uh taking the control of inner cycle to out i mean the usually the hormones are the making the menstrual cycle regular so we are when you are giving the hormones outside it will automatically that is regular however if there is no uh the if the hormonal contraceptives is giving heavy menstrual bleeding one thing you can try is is change the brand of the hormone contraceptives because of, there are different brands so the uh because some have the the their type of progesterone is diff, di, different some have disogestrol some have a etanogestrol some have noethestrol so just look at the progesterone and then you can change into the change the brand so and that most of the time that will help because of some some have low estrogen some have high estrogen so just look at the estrogen levels and the what the progesterone they have and then you can change the brand and if it is i uh, if you somebody is cannot have a ucd then of course she can go for like kind of a thing like jadel or anything but the best thing is to have the change the brand of hormonal contraceptive yeah. sir um, yeah. the next question is uh, how i understood is uh, a patient with pcod uh, whether they can be uh, with low bmi the question yeah there is a category called uh, uh slim pcos so which is very difficult to treat even though they have the what is the most likely uh, the pathophysiology of low bmi 
uh, PCOS is the hormonal insulin resistance in the uh, in the receptors. So this is they can have the BMI. So but the, so without low BMI, even they ha can have the PCOS, which is when at that time the uh, to call the transvaginal scan is helpful. So we usually manage them as normal PCOS. And but even with low BMI, exercise will help. Exercise will help for the PCOS. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are getting more questions regarding the contraception and the uh, amenorrhea because uh, due to some contraceptive pills or the contraceptive method, the people do experience amenorrhea. So when should we uh, screen for the endometrial CA uh, during that period, sir? Yeah, when a, when a lady having bleeding with hormone, okay. Uh, so it is depend on the contraceptive method, actually. Suppose if you are on deeper provera, you will not have periods. That is because of the uh, outside progesterone. So if 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 a, if a girl is on deeper provera, progesterone DMPA, and then she doesn't she may not have periods for about two years. That that is expected. So you don't have to screen them for endometrial CA because of that is outside progesterone. You have outside progesterone, and then of course uh, you don't have to uh, give. Uh, make treatment for it thank you sir and uh, they are asking when should we screen for endometrial cancer for a patient with uh, pcos sorry all that, uh, uh, the question is sir when should we screen for endometrial cancer uh, a patient when, when a patient has uh, pcos Okay, that is again, uh, so that is again, that's what I mentioned. It is for the, uh, when they have oligomenorrhea. So even with the PCOS, if she's having periods, suppose the aim is to have periods at least for once in three months. So if it is, so when, when I'm managing a PCOS patients, I make sure they bleed at least once in three months. Otherwise, they will develop to endometrial cancer. But suppose a girl comes with the amenorrhea for eight months, definitely you need to screen for a, the, uh, in a, the endometrial hyperplasia or malignancy. That is done by the transvaginal scan. So the transvaginal scan being done by any way. And with the transvaginal scan, you can clearly assess the endometrium, the thickness, regularity, and the appearance. Then, of course, it's, if it is suspicious, we go for a biopsy. Thank you so much, sir. And the next question is uh, whether do we use metformin to treat PCOS? Yes, the, the metformin is an insulin uh, receptor sensitizer, so metformin is used. But as I mentioned, the PCOS, the metformin, and the, you can give the um, outside hormones, those all are supportive. The main key stay of managing the PCOS is diet. So unless you go for a healthy diet, you can't trade. Actually, a PCOS is a consequence of unhealthy diet. So it's simply you need to reverse the reverse revert revert to the healthy diets, then the PCOS will automatically uh, automatically reverse. And you need to have it is not not what I usually mention is I don't all the patient doesn't need to be go for a dietary advice, dietary referral, diet plans kind of a thing. It's you can, she can simply cut off the carbohydrates, reduce the amount of rice she eat, and add more green leaves, and completely cut off the wheat flour, or the rice bread and bread products. So that bread and bread product is the main culprit. So you can, so what I usually ask of the girls with PCOS to 100% cut off the bread products, bread and fish buns. All, all the bread products. And so when you cut off the all the bread products, it works 50% works with, remarkably. So not only the uh, not, uh, and, and the and the sugary drinks like you know the fizzy drinks, malted drinks. So those things when you cut off these things, so you don't have to go for a healthy, very, very stringent diet plan. So simply you can cut off all these unhealthy foods, then it will 
more fifty percent of the time it revert. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is uh, perimenopausal me. Sorry, uh, the perimenopausal bleeding uh, in women of uh, um, age of uh, menopause. What are the indication for screening, sir? Sorry, perimenopausal bleeding. In a woman uh, of age of menopause, mm -hmm. what are um, indication for screening of uh, endometrial cancer? All right, so the that is why that the symptom itself. So with the with this irregular bleeding, and the at the age of course is more than forty five years of age, you need to have a transvaginal scan. When you have a scan and a, then there's assessment of endometrium. So it depends on the appearance of the endometrium. You can choose which, if it is needed, the biopsy. But if it is thin and regular and the symptoms and it, it comes with the management of the patient. So if, if whether she's having a family history of endometrial cancer, endometrial CA, and if she's obese, if she's smoking. So all these factors contribute when it comes to the patient. And then, then when, they, when there's a transvaginal scan, if you see a suspicious of endometrium, and if it is a generalized lesion, you can always go for a pupil biopsy or anything. If it is a focal lesion, you can have a diagnostic hysteroscopy. So it's all tailor-made for the patient. So, but what is the key message is when there is abnormal menstruation, she need to get investigated. So investigation is most of the time in the in the sense of transvaginal scan. And when you need to assess the, the uterus and the endometrium, you need to have a transvaginal scan. There's no point of assessing from abdominal scan. So I have seen a lot of people have assessed with the abdominal scan and come. There's no point. You need to have a transvaginal scan. That is where the optimum assessment comes because of, and some people worried about, so an age of 45, 60, and some, some sometimes when the woman is unmarried, it's difficult. But so it, it, it's most of them, I, what I tell my patients is the, Vaginal scan is more important and rather than thinking about whether she has, hasn't had a sexual intercourse before, because of if you say anything, anything abnormal, she need to have a DNC anyway, the endometrial sampling and sometimes the hysterectomy. So it is not a matter of uh, consider about the, but of course you have to respect the patient's wishes, but you need to tell about the patient the importance of having a scan. Thank you, sir. A few more queries from the participants. Uh, yes. Is there any association between prolactin level and PCOS in a woman who is not pregnant or lactating? What may be? No, 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 no correlation. There might be slight elevation of the prolactin, but there is the, the but the prolactinomas, the high prolactin level also causes the oligomenorrhea and, or, and amenorrhea. So that is a different entity that is usually because of the prolactinoma, microprolactinomas and stuff. So if the prolactin levels are high, you are not thinking about the PCOS. You're thinking about the pro, uh, the pituitary tumors and the sometimes the uh, prolactin secretion tumors. So therefore, so if the prolactin levels are high, so you have to work on other diagnoses. I didn't mention all the all the causes of the oligomenorrhea. There are there are list of so much of, but I discuss common problems. So therefore, if there are the prolactin levels is high, you are not considering about the PCOS. You have to think about the other entity. All right. Thank you so much, sir. The last question is any significant association with an unmarried woman and increased risk of endometrial cancer? If so, what are the preventing measures? Yeah, uh, any associated unmarried woman. Yes, there is association because the uh, if the if there is a, uh, what you call that the, if the endometrium has, when there's a, there's no poses in the, there's a risk. What is the risk is when a lady is pregnant, the, all the ovaries and endometrium and these cycle stops and poses. So that gives a break and fresh clearing up. So that is why there's a slight risk of increase in the unmarried woman with the increase, there's slight increased risk of ovarian and endometrial cancers. But there's no risk reducing facts or anything, preventive measures. Only thing is you need to have K 
keep an eye because of the endometrial cancers very easy to detect because of it always always gives a menstrual abnormality so it is the so what is the what you have to be keep on eye is whether she is having a regular menstrual period if somebody is unmarried married or anything or even in obese if she's having a regular menstrual periods her chances of having endometrial pathology is virtually zero because there's no logic when a, when there's endometrial pathology and having a regular period regular menstrual cycles so as so always need to be keep on eye that is a very good reassuring sign is having a regular menstrual cycle normal not not the not with the contraceptive pills and stuff but when it is normal menstrual cycle so that is of course you can keep on eye whether she's having any menstrual irregularities Thank you very much, sir. Uh, just one more question pop up just now. Uh, yeah. A patient with uh, menorrhagia in 13 to 16 years of age, when do you suspect a hematological cause? Yeah, so that is again the assessment, isn't it? Clinical assessment need to be come. So when you need to suspect? So when obviously when there is, a, if there's any other bleeding abnormalities, then of course 13 to 16 age, when there's menorrhagia, if it is coming with fatigue and any increased tendency to bleeding, of course you have to be thin. And the other thing, if it is not, you cannot see a very clear clause like fibroids and the things you need to be have. Obviously one thing is you have, you will, can always have an investigation and see that ITP is one of the commonest cause of menorrhagia at young girls. So the you can look for the ITP, ITP, uh the features of itp so that's how you have to be it is very simply very clinically you can assess thank you very much sir, for the clear explanation and uh, that's all the queries are for today uh and i would like to thank you uh on behalf of gmoa and society for uh, health research and innovation sir, for your wonderful presentation and to make the time for us today and also, we would like to uh, present your talk on appreciation on behalf of GMOA and the Society for Health Research and Innovation. Thank you very much, sir. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if say, if the, I can see some more questions pop up, actually, so you can type my email address there. I'll type my email address there. So if somebody's need to have questions, you can they can email it to me. So then it is so. Uh, Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. So yes. then, so then of course, the other questions. Thank you very much, sir. So we will be releasing uh, the consultant email to the chat box. Please uh, refer him for your further queries. And uh, we are concluding today's session. Thank you for your, all of your participation. And please stay with us and fill the a form to receive your e-certificate of the participation. And also please find out the um, e in the chat box. Thank you for joining us today. This is Dr. Sinta signing off. We will be uh, keep the session open for some time for you all to fill the Google form to receive your participation certificate. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir.